of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God uh, that hath dealt, dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Uh, I'm wondering, is there anybody today living in the blessings of the Lord uh, who God has begun to restore uh, all what's been taken from you in the past? Uh, we are living in the moment today uh, that God is going to give us back the years uh, that we've lost. Uh, the things that have passed away, uh, he's going to bring all new. Uh, I'm telling you today, it's time to rejoice uh, and praise God for his goodness. to be praised. I will sing unto the Lord that bless his holy name. You are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent, there is none that can compare. You are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent, there is none that can compare, I've come to bless your name. Hallelujah. Anybody come to bless him today? I will sing unto the Lord, for he is worthy, he is worthy to, to be praised. praised. I will sing unto the Lord, and bless his holy name. Unto the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. I will sing unto the Lord and bless His holy name. You are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent. There is none that can compare. You are holy. You are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent, there is none that can compare, I've come to bless your name. Anybody come to bless his name on a Sunday afternoon? Come on, why don't you lift your voices to him right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, bless his name, bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name, bless his name, bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name, bless his name. Come on, bless his name. Let everybody, hallelujah, bless his name, hallelujah. Let everybody come and bless his name, bless his name, bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Hallelujah. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Hallelujah. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Come on, sing it with us. Come and bless his name. Bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Come on, bless his name right now. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name, bless his name, bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. 
You are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent, there is none that can compare. You are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are victorious, you are mighty, you are omnipotent, there is none that can compare. Come to bless your name. Hallelujah. Come on right now. Would you clap your hands and bless his name right now? Come on, somebody. He's been too good to me. He's been too good to my family. Oh, come on, somebody. We've come to bless his name right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name, bless his name. Let everybody come. Bless his name. Bless, bless his, his name. name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless, bless his, his name. name. Bless, bless his name. name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Let everybody come and bless his name. You are holy. You are righteous. You are magnificent. You are victorious. You are mighty. You are omnipotent. There is none that can compare. I've come to bless your name. Hallelujah. Come on right now. Come on. It feels good in the house right now. Hallelujah. Come on. We've come to lift up the name of Jesus right now. How did anybody come expecting a move of the Holy Ghost in your life? Anybody come expecting a move of the Holy Ghost in your job? In your family. Come on, don't let him run by himself. Hallelujah. Come on, anybody come to bless him his name right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many want the Holy Ghost to fall on us right now? Hallelujah. is close this victory feeling is called the Holy Ghost it's rest and refreshing it's heavenly power an encore of Pentecost is happening this hour let it fall on me let it fall on me let the Holy Ghost and fire fall on me. Let it fall on me. Let it fall on me. Let a Pentecostal revival fall on me. Let it fall on me. Come on, let it fall on me, Jesus. Let it fall on me. Oh, let the Holy Ghost and fire. Fall on me, let it fall on me, let it fall on me, let it be the cost of revival, fall on me. Come on, a breakthrough 
is coming. Let it fall on me. Oh, let it fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost and fire fall on me. Let it fall on me. Let it fall on me. Let it cause the revival fall on me. Somebody say, I can feel it in my hands. Can you feel it in your feet? If you got the Holy Ghost, you ought to begin to move your feet for just a moment. Somebody ought to do like the Bible said and praise him in the dance. Somebody ought to leap for joy. Somebody ought to feel it in your feet and run an aisle. It's the Holy Ghost. I can feel it in my hands. I can feel it in my feet. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? Don't let our new ones run by themselves. You ought to give God some praise on a Sunday afternoon. You ought to wave your hands and sing it to Him. Baptized with fresh fire. This is my time. Renew me with new tongues. Revive me with new wine. Baptize me with fresh fire. This is my time. I want you to begin to wave your hands as they begin to sing it. I can feel it. You ought to wave your hands and move your feet while you're singing. It's all over me. Can you feel it in your hands? Can you feel it in your feet? Somebody ought to wave your hands and shout it out. It's all over me. 
you ought to give God praise just because he's worthy of it right now. From the front to the back, you ought to give God the highest praise you've given him all day. Come on, I can feel it in my hands. I can feel it down in my heart. I can feel it in my feet. For the next 30 seconds, somebody ought to leap for joy. Somebody ought to praise him in a dance. You ought to give God praise just because he's worthy of it right now. feel the Holy Ghost in the house on a Sunday afternoon. Don't let him run by himself. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost on a Sunday afternoon. I can feel it down in my hands. I've got it down in my heart. I've got it down in my feet. Welcome to Pentecost. The Bible said he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. When you get on fire, you're not going to be quiet about it. Everybody around you is going to know that something in you is on fire. Your vocals get louder. Your hands start moving. It's hard to be quiet when you've got fire burning on you. I wonder if there's anybody at a Jesus name One God Church right here at the Red Bluff Community Center, 1500 South Jackson Street, that's been baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And with fire. You ought to give him praise one more time because God brought you out. It's all over me. Praise God. Amen. It's good to be in God's house today. It's good to be in God's house today. It's good to be on my way to heaven today. I'm glad to be a part of a church that's alive today. Are there any blessed people in the house choosing blessing today? Hallelujah. To all of our guests that are with us today, welcome home. And you may not realize this, but you picked the greatest time to come to the North State Pentecostals. This church is living in the days of answered prayers. And you're jumping right in the middle of the journey with us. And I want you to know you became a part of a blessed people today. The blessings of God are flowing on his people in this room. You hear those people responding? Those are blessed people that are testifying. Come on, you picked a good time to be a part of the North State Pentecostals. God's blessing his people. And I got good news for you. Jesus is still just getting started. He's still just getting started. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Today is a special day. You can put the baby dedication. We are dedicating. I think, I think this kid loves me the most out of all the kids. Between him and Selah, I think they're fighting over who loves me the most. But he rarely says no to coming to me. And we're going to dedicate baby Jalen today to the Lord. And I would like for his family to come up, mom and dad, as well as any other extended family that are here that would like to join them, come gather here in front of the pulpit. And uh, these are special occasions. Amen. These are special occasions. There's a lot of people, their kids are growing up, and all they know is mom and dad fighting and drinking. And, but, but this is a blessed baby today. He's going to grow up in a home that puts God first. What a great blessing Jalen has on his life. And so today is the dedication of Jalen Leonard Leggett. Did I say Leonard right, Brother Sherwin? Okay. He wanted to make sure that it was Leonard and not Leonard. So I said it's not Leonard. Where are we at here? Amen. Now, I want you to understand what we're doing here today. This does not save the child. This does put him in the hands of God. A baby dedication, brother and sister Leggett, is empowered when mom and dad realize that this is accepting an incredibly important responsibility of making sure the most important thing in that baby's life is Jesus and the ways of God and his church. Too many times parents can view dedication as saying, okay, God, I'm trusting you. I'm putting him in your hands trusting you with his life and future, 
and walk away thinking that absolves them of responsibility to keep the child in the ways of God. Never let this world lie to you and say, well, I don't want to push my beliefs on my children. Because while you're silent, this world is pushing their beliefs on your children. And so a dedication is mom and dad accepting responsibility that I'm going to raise my child in the way that he should go. This is the tragic story of a man by the name of Hezekiah. As Hezekiah decided, his personal present enjoyment was more important than preserving the dedication and sanctity of his children. Isaiah 39 tells us that Hezekiah lets the king of Babylon into his house, and it says it showed him his precious things and access all that was in his dominion. We've got to be careful what we let in our houses because, Brother Sister Leggett, you've got precious things in your house. And he opened up to Babylon, and they saw everything. And the man of God came and said, what have they seen? He said, there's nothing in my house that was not hid. And he looks at him and says, judgment's coming, but it's not going to be upon you. He said, you're going to lose everything, but it's going to happen to your children. What you thought you could handle is going to affect your kids. And when Hezekiah should have said, God, please forgive me. Don't let my children have to deal with this. His response was, that's okay. At least there'll be peace and truth in my days. Hezekiah lived a life that traded his children's future in God for his present selfish desires. But truly dedicating your children to God is mom and dad living a dedicated life that does not create chaos for their children's future. It's a life lived by mom and dad that creates an atmosphere in the home that produces in the children a desire to live for God. It's dedication that frees the child from having to experience the atrocities that you may have experienced in your past. Giving the baby back to God is making a commitment to God that I'm going to take the child you entrusted me with and I'm going to do everything I can to teach little Jalen to love God with all of his heart and with all of his might. This is the primary principle of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, us one as Pentecostals know this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jalen, there's only one God, and his name is Jesus. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I'm fixing to hold you, buddy. Don't worry. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Jesus adds more to this in the New Testament. And he says, these words I command thee shall be in your heart. That's all well and good. But then he says, thou shalt teach them diligently to your children. Talk when you sit about it in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you get up. So not only are you teaching them verbally, but physically the way you walk teaches them. When you sit, your behavior is teaching them. How you start your day when you rise up in the morning is teaching them. When you lie down, when you get up, not only are they hearing what you say, they're watching how you walk. They need to hear you say it, but they need to watch you walk it. When you walk by the way, they need to see you walking right. It's God first in my words, Jalen, but it's God first in mommy and daddy's life too. What are you doing when you live consecrated? I'm giving my child back to God, and I'm dedicating him to you, God. How am I doing that? I'm dedicating my child to God by living a dedicated life and raising them in a dedicated to God home so that they grow up, and I've made God look so beautiful to them that they desire the God that I serve. What kind of home is that? It's a home free of the influences of the world. Free of the influences of Hollywood and our world entertainment system. Free from the chaos, the tension, the tension, the cussing, the carnality. It is a home that becomes God's home. A sanctuary, a worshiping home. Brother and Sister Leggett, it's a dedicated home that raises dedicated children. And so, God, I'm going to live a dedicated life so that I can dedicate Jalen, back to you, and pray that God, as he grows up, you use him for your glory. This baby, come on, buddy, me and you are best friends. This baby is full of promise. God's got promise invested in him. 
God's got a future in the kingdom invested in him. And there's a great responsibility on mom and dad to make sure you do everything in your power to not let the enemy get a foothold in your home that would rob baby Jalen of the destiny God has for him. There's no telling. This kid, he's a blank canvas. There's no telling what's going to happen in his future in the kingdom of God if the Lord tarries. Jalen, you love pastor? I'll take that silence as a yes, I do. You're my favorite person in the world. And so today, we're going to join together in prayer. And we're going to say, God, thank you for this baby. And God, by your help, we're going to put him back in your hands and raise him in your presence so that your will can be done in his life. I wonder if you'd stand with me and just stretch your hands in this direction toward the families up here. Family, would you just gather in close and let's begin to pray for this baby right now. Amen. What we just did is very important. We want to start our kids off right. We can't make all the choices for them, but we can start them off right and do our best to help them want to make the right choices. Amen. We're going to continue in worship, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We have some prayer requests on the screen. If you've got a special need that you'd like to be prayed for, you can come forward. We'll anoint you with oil. But maybe you've just got some needs in your life that haven't made it to the screen. Maybe you want to just lift a hand. There's things you're praying about, situations going on in your life. We know that God is a prayer-answering God. Why don't we lift our voices right now? Let's bring our needs before the Lord right now. God, we love you. God, you see every name that's on this list right now. God, you see every situation. God, you are the healer. God, we lift every need up before you right now. We pray your healing virtue would flow. God, I pray you'd move in this service right now. God, there's people here that need the Holy Ghost, that need healing, that need deliverance. Lord, there's no door that you open that the enemy can shut. God, let the goodness of God begin to flow right now. Come on, there's a touch of the Holy Ghost here. All over the building, why don't you just close your eyes, lift your hands, and begin to thank him for what he's doing in this place today.
stand upon the word you've given me. So you won't relent till it's complete. And every word you spoke will surely come to pass. believe you're moving you're not finished yet Shut it. No one can shut it. No 
devil from hell can stop what God has started. When God gives you a word, it's ever settled. It's ever settled. It's ever settled. No devil from hell can stop what God has promised. Creator, healer, wonder-working, miracle God, you can do anything. I know you're moving, I know you're working it out, so I will be right where you're standing why don't you lift your hands come on if you've got a need in this house come on the creator the healer he's in this house right now come on there's somebody in this place you've come here with a specific need and you're looking for an answer I've got news for you today the healer the creator come on the problem solver he's in this place right now Lift your hands and call upon the name of Jesus right now. Come on, somebody, call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, no one can shut it. No one can shut it. No devil from hell can stop what God is starting. Come on, if He started a work in your life. No one can stop it. God gives you a word. God gives you a word. It's never said. Shut up, Tara. It's never said. Oh, Jesus. No devil from hell can stop what God has promised. Oh, 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 oh. When God opens a door, no one can shut it. No one can shut it. Shut up, Tara. No one, no one can shut, shut it. it. Not your family. No devil from hell, no devil from hell can stop what God has taught you. When God gives you a word, it's ever said, it's ever said, oh, no devil from hell can stop what God has promised. When God opens a door, no one can shut it, no one can shut it. No devil from hell can stop what God is starting. When God gives you a word, it's ever settled, it's ever settled. No devil from hell can stop what God has promised. In the name of Jesus, healer, wonder-working, miracle God, you can do, you can do anything, Jesus. I know you're moving, I know you're working it out, so I will be. Come on, sing it with us. Creator, Creator healer, want to work in miracle God. You can do anything. I know you're moving. I know you're working it out. So I will be.
Why don't you just lift your hands? There's a sweet touch of the Holy Ghost here. Close your eyes. Forget about what's coming next. You're not finished yet. Close your eyes. If you believe what we're singing, you ought to just begin to thank God that he's working right now. Come on, let the tears roll down your face. Let the emotions begin to break forth out of your heart. God hears your prayer right now. He's not finished. You're not finished yet. Come on, there's something breaking loose right now. Come on, there's something happening in this room right now. The devil is a liar. I curse every spirit of fear. I curse the depression. I curse the addiction. Somebody do what you feel in the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody do what you feel in the Holy Ghost right now. Go, go, go. Come on. Somebody put the enemy under your feet today. Devil, you're a liar. Somebody praise God the way your soul wants to cry out right now. Devil, you're not having my marriage. Devil, you're not having my spirit. You're not having my children. You're not having my heart. I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you and begin to pray that God would work in their life right now. Come on, there's enemies fighting people in this church. We're going to bind together and believe right now that God's going to begin to break some chains. Come on, you don't know what that man or woman's going through. I want you to lift your voice and pray in the Holy Ghost. Devil, back up. Devil, back up. Loose them and let them go. Go ahead, Sister Swirling. Go ahead, Brother Jason. Right there, right there. Go, go, go. Something's breaking loose in the Holy Ghost. That's it, Brother Nelson. Go ahead, Sister Tammy. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead, Brother Steve. Come on, there's things breaking loose right now in the Holy Ghost. God's fixing things right now. There are things being healed right now. We're in the area of answered prayers right now. This is not just a bunch of emotion. This is where the saints of God begin to gain ground in victory in the Holy Ghost. This is where the saints of God tell hell, back up. This is my house. This is my family. This is my church. This is my marriage. Doesn't belong to you. Don't belong to depression. It doesn't belong to moral failure. Come on, the devil's been lying to somebody. What you're doing right now is not preparing you for the battle. This is the battle. You're letting hell know, God's still working in my life. We're to be the head, 
and not the tail. We're to be above only and never beneath. There's a victory moment happening right now in this room. And I believe the Holy Ghost is telling somebody right now, it's time to be all in. Throw away all the things holding you back. Well, what about that? Just throw all that away and jump in and let God begin to turn your world and your family around. Amen. 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 Let's lift our hands one more time and just thank God for what he's doing in this room right now. Come on, while you're praying, our ushers are coming forward. We're going to continue to pray right now. God, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. We're going to continue in worship. We're going to take up our offering. I'm going to let the man of God preach. Our ushers are going to come to you today, so you don't have to march. They're going to come to you. I want you to begin to worship as we sing again. Remember, Wednesday night is our men's Bible study at 6 p.m. Let's pray over this offering. God, we love you. We thank you for the honor to worship you in our giving. I pray, God, you'd bless every tither, bless every giver, bless your people. It's an honor to give back to you in Jesus' name. As they begin to serve you, we're going to continue to worship before the man of God comes. Our Sunday school can be dismissed right now and make their way to their class. God bless our children.
What an anointing of the Holy Ghost that's in this place today. How many of you appreciate what you feel in this house? If you really appreciate what you feel, why don't you just lift your hands and thank God for the beautiful anointing that's been in the tabernacle today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Won't you be seated for just a few moments? Uh, just a few things I want to say before I go to the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and the uh, first one is, is I'm thankful for our great church at home today. In fact, they don't know what time we have service, and so they were blowing my phone up, sending me pictures and victory reports and all that while we was having to have church, trying to have church here today. But uh, that's a good problem. Uh, thankful for good church at home. I'm also very, very happy to have uh, my wife with me this time. She didn't come last time. I'm glad she's here. I look a lot better when she's with me than I do without her. I don't know how y'all put up with all, all this when, when she ain't here to, to balance it. So I'm glad she's here. Also thankful to uh, uh, have the honor of being with you at your marriage retreat over the last couple of days. What a great time we had. And if you, boy, if you missed out on that, you missed something great. Uh, and I don't, I'm not uh, talking about me. I'm just talking about it was a great time. They, the, you have a first class, awesome working pastor and pastor's wife. You really do. I, I'm just telling you, Red Bluff was blessed when these people came. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just amazed. They worked very, very hard. I know they were very, very uh, tired and by the time it was over, you could just see the, uh, just the sigh of relief uh, because they put so much in. And uh, to all you that helped them make that great, you just, you just did a great job. It, it was just a tremendous time. And, uh, of course, Sister Copeland and I enjoyed so much uh, being a part of that. We've done uh, uh, one, one or two of those. Uh, I can't remember. Well, we, I, actually, when I get to remember, we've done several uh, it's not just our forte, but it is something we enjoy doing. So thank you to all that walked up and said thank you, and you appreciated it. We did a good job today. That meant, meant a lot to, to hear that. Thank you for that. Uh, we gave our, our best to it, I'll tell you that. And I thought it just turned out uh, tremendous. But it was because of your great leadership uh, that, it, that it went so well. And then what an honor to be with you today. What an honor to be here in this service. Um, I don't miss many Sundays a year to be other places, but I'm just telling you last time I was here, it's like God just bound my heart to you people. This, this is a great church. This is a great, great church. I, I don't know of anywhere I preach that I feel more potential than I do right here. There is so much potential for greatness in you group of people. My God. And, uh, and uh, all of you couples sitting out there in your 20s and 30s and even in your 40s, you're not here by accident. God has brought you together under the leadership of this great pastor and pastor's wife for one of the greatest things that God has done in Northern California. I'm just telling you, you're sitting on the precipice. The next great paradigm shift of revival, the centrifuge, the epicenter is going to be right here. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. It's right here. It's right here, and he has brought together, he's jailed and brought together the right people for the right time. So I want to thank Brother and Sister Cox real quick before I get ahead of myself for great meals. 
just a great time. Uh, I, I'm just telling you, they fed us some of the greatest meals in some of the best restaurants, and and uh, last night was no different. Uh, nice rooms to stay in. You, you guys are just first class. This is, and that's the way it ought to be. This is a five star church with five star leadership and five star people. So thank you so much. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be. Sister Copeland, come up here and say something for our, for our preach. Come up here and testify. Pre- preach a little bit. Man, if you'll get to preaching, I'll just go sit down. Well, I'm honored to be here. appreciate Brother and Sister Cox. Uh, this is a great church. I love what I feel here today. Really excited for y'all. It's really full in here. So anyway, love you guys and so glad to be here. And I'm not going to preach. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that she's with me today. Uh, it is. This building's full. Full. You, man, you're going to have to do something. And you know what? The wonderful thing is, is I said that wrong. You're not going to have to do anything because God's working on it right now. He's working right now. While we're having church, God's working. While you were asleep last night, God was working. Woo. While you were enjoying your weekend, God was working. I, I'm telling, oh my God. How, see, you think, you think I'm just talking, but I'm not. I, I, I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost. Woo, I'm seeing it. God's showing it to me as I'm speaking. God's been working on this deal. Every bit of this is being worked out by the hand of God. Mm-hmm, my God. And so much greater than you could ever dream, so much greater than you could ever think of. Man, when it gels and it comes together, you're going to say, man, I never dream it could be this great. It could be this good. It, that it could be this right. Hmm. I, uh, I, I want to compliment this, this worship team. Uh, I've, I've, I've preached in churches three times, four times the size of this congregation that did not have the worship team that you've got. Your musicians, your singers. Everything is just tremendous. God, again, God's putting it together. And uh, you got the greatest pastor's wife anybody could ever ask for, the hardest working pastor's wife. Isn't it, isn't it great when you're, when you're on a team like this to help a pastor and pastor's wife, isn't it great whenever you're helping someone and you know in your heart Whatever I'm doing, if they had the energy and they had the extra hands, they'd be glad to do it. Man, I don't like to work for somebody that I think that I'm doing everything so they don't have to. I like to I like to help someone that I know I'm freeing them up to do something else or greater things. or You know, they're not having to do this menial task so that they can lead other people. That's, that's the kind of team I like to be on. And that's the kind of pastor's wife that you have. What a great, great, great pastoral family. And uh, then, uh, you, you, which you know this, I don't have to tell you this, but your pastor's one of the greatest preachers in Pentecost. He really is. You've got one of the greatest preachers. How- How did how did Red Bluff end up with all this? Man, how'd the Pentecostals of North State end up with all of this? The North State Pentecostals. How how did you end up with such a team? I'm not asking that question because I don't know the answer. God has decided to elevate this city. And he's decided to use this church to do it. 
Everybody in Pentecost across this nation and other countries is about to hear what's going on in this town to this church. Because the rumbling has already started. The earthquake is already beginning. Mm. I, I, I'm not just talking. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost. I, 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 I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost. I just, I, I don't, my wife will tell you I don't, I don't do what I've done here. I don't, I don't go, come to a place and five months later come back on a Sunday. I hadn't got that many to spare. But there's something going on here I want to be a part of. I've got my mind made up. I'm going to be a part of this. I felt it last time I was here, and you've already started moving into it. Hmm. i got to go with the Word of God. Stand together. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Proverbs 18 and 21. I want to request that this praise team come back and uh, do, that, do that last song that you did again for my altar call. I believe God's going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost today that's never had the Holy Ghost before. I believe people's going to get the Holy Ghost today that's never talked in tongues before. If you're in this house and you've never received this gift of the Holy Ghost, I want to tell you, you, you can't be a part of this until you do because that's the entrance. That's how you step in. If you wonder, how, how do I get involved in this, you got to get the Holy Ghost. The, the Holy Ghost is the entrance. It is the beginning. It's what opens everything up in you for the rest of what's going on. Hallelujah. And then there are several uh, families that God wants to put you up to something today. Hmm. Yeah, I heard what you, you, you know, you know when you're uh, run, running with a bunch of guys or a bunch of girls and they start putting you up to stuff? Anybody know what I'm talking about? God likes to put people up to stuff. He likes to say, why don't you be the next one that I bless financially so you can pour into the church? I'd like to put you up to being a giver. I'd like to put you up to being a leader in worship. God's going to suggest some things to you today. He's going to whisper some things in your ear. And when he does, you don't need to just sit there. You need to step out. I, I, I want to say this, but God plays Simon says. He never makes the first act. Now, listen to what I'm saying. I know you're standing. Bear with me just a minute. I didn't mean to say this right now. This is Holy Ghost. God plays Simon says. He never makes the first step. It doesn't matter if you're a blind man. He says, tell him to come over here where I am. Because it's not faith if he moves first. The only way it's faith is you got to make the first move. Everything in God's kingdom is acted, activated by faith. You can be full of the Holy Ghost, sitting on a church pew, and never receive one answer from God if you don't activate it by faith. It don't just come to you. It's got to be activated by a faith move. And so you can sit there and leave, live beneath all the blessings of God if you sit there and say, well, if God would just touch me. Well, if God would just change my circumstances, if God would just step in, he, I, I got a news for you. He's never going to. Because God plays Simon Says, and you've got to make the first move. And if you take a little step, God takes a little step. And if you take a big step, God takes a big step. And if you leap, God leaps. And if you run toward God, God runs toward you. But you've got to make the first step. And God does what you do. See, there's people that say, well, if God would give me a million dollars, I'd give half of it to the church. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. Because you've got to make the first step. 
and you wouldn't do it anyway. You say, how do I know? Because, because he gave you a thousand, you didn't give five hundred. And that's why he's not going to give you a million. Because he trusted you with that thousand. And you didn't give 500. You see, he said the only way he'll make you ruler over big things is you got to be a pr- proved to be a good ruler over small things. And he gave you that thousand to see what you'd do with it. He gave you a thousand to see if he could trust you with a million. Mm. You got to make the first step. Somebody said, well, if God would really bless me, there's just no telling how I'd bless the church. Well, get started. Get started with what you've already got. It's not, oh my God, you're not hearing me. It's not faith if he's got to move first. Anybody can do that. An unbeliever can give out of abundance. Any old sinner out here on the street can give out of abundance. I'm going to tell you, when it's faith and when you trust God, it's when you give when it's tight. It takes real faith in God to give that last $100 bill. That's real trust. And if you're unwilling to do that, why should he do anything for you if you don't trust him? So God plays Simon says, he wants to know, do you trust me enough to run a risk for me? Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. Listen, I know you're standing. I didn't mean to leave you standing. Would you lift your hands just a second before we go to the Word? Something's happening special in this place right now. They're special people you're talking to right now, God. This is their service. They're special people that this is their service to do something special for them. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Uh, Worship team, be ready because I want you to come back and do that last song in just a few minutes. I'm not going to preach long. This message is for every individual that's in this building. If you're a human and you're breathing, this message is for you. But there's about five people in this room that this is special to you today. For you, it's going to go to another level. For you, it's going to break chains of doubt and bondage that you've lived under too long. And if you'll let God, if you'll take that first step that I'm talking about, I don't know what it is, but God's going to speak it to you. I don't know if it's stepping out in the aisle. I don't know if it's running. I don't know if it's coming to this front. I don't know if it's opening up your wallet or your purse and giving a faith pledge. And I'm not here after your money. So I said, he's here after money. No, I'm flying home. I won't, whatever you give, it won't go in my pocket. It has nothing to do with that. It's not about you, me. It's about you. It's about you proving to God your trust and confidence in him. I don't know what he's going to ask of you today, but something's coming in the Holy Ghost. Proverbs 18 and verse 21. I'm going to read it quickly and let you be seated. Proverbs 18 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Would you be seated? Lift your hands where you're seated and ask God to speak to you. Ask the Holy Ghost to speak to you in this place today. Come on. Come on, that's it. Cry out to the Lord. Woo, cry out to the Lord. Ooh, cry out to him today. Mm. 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 My God, God wants to do something special for you today. Ah. There's something beyond the norm for you today. I'm going to tell you, there's some people sitting in this building right now that you thought you just came 
to, to, to spend a, a, a Sunday in church never expecting that everything in your life is going to change today. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, if you can grab a hold of this, everything in your life is going to change today. 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 It's activated by faith. If you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. Can you put my scripture back just real quick? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, they that love what? Well, let's go back and ask, what do you love? Do you love death or do you love life? Now, everybody's going to say that they love life. But how have you been talking? What's been coming out of your mouth, doubt or faith? Fear or hope? What have you been talking about, about how bad things are or how good things are? What have you been speaking, how tough things are? What have you been speaking about your marriage? What have you been speaking about your home? What have you been speaking about your finances? What have you been speaking about where you live? What have you been speaking about your city, your neighborhood, your town, your house? What have you been speaking death or have you been speaking life? What have your children been hearing? What are you setting your children up for? If we called your children in here and interviewed them today and said, what, what's your parents' attitude? Would they, say it was one, would they testify that it was one of life or one of death? Would they testify that because of what they'd been hearing you say, they had a lot of faith and hope for life? Or they were full of anxiety and fear? What kind of home are you creating? What are you doing to your family? Man, I didn't mean to bind it down like that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it. In other words, whatever fruit... Whatever you love, that's the fruit you're going to eat. Your family, your home, your job, the people around you are either eating the fruit of death or they're eating the fruit of life. You're either killing them or you're giving them life. You're either destroying them or you're giving them life. But notice there is no in-between. Somebody said, that's one scripture. That's okay. I got plenty of others. I want to preach to you for this for just a few minutes. I'm going to do my best to hurry, but this is what I'm going to preach. You are the creator of your own culture. You are the creator of your own culture. I want everybody to hear me. You are the creator of your own culture. Now listen to what I'm saying right now. We are created in God's image and after the likeness of God. We are the only creation in God's economy that God did not speak into existence. God got down on his knees as though it were and formed you out of the dust of the ground and then <laughs> breathed the breath of of life into you. Everybody here, I need you to hear what I'm saying right now. When God breathed the breath of life in you, you became the only creation God ever created that is just like God. If you want to know what God looks like, look at the person sitting beside you. Because they look like God. I'm not, here to, I'm not here to do a marriage retreat. We did that yesterday. But that person that you live with is created in the image of God and after the likeness of God. You better be careful how you treat them. They're God's creation. 
They're God's creation. Now, now listen, this is important. If I'm created in the image of God and after the likeness of God, we, we don't understand what all we lost in the fall. But if I'm created in the image of God and after the likeness of God, I want everybody to hear me, and this is why I'm going to go through several warnings that God gave us in the Bible. But everything else other than me, God spoke it into existence. His spoken word was the way he expressed himself or went out from himself. John 1 and 1 tells us in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. You can't take God's word and make it a separate God. It was the way he expressed himself. He spoke, let there be light, and the lights came on. He spoke, let there be fish in the sea. and The seas were filled with fish. Hang on. If I am made in the image of God and after the likeness of God and the wisdom of God was put in me by God, you say, well, how can you prove that? The Bible says that God walked and talked with Adam in the cool of the evening. What did they talk about if he didn't know anything? How many of you would like to walk and talk with God about the stars and the universes and all that? You that educated? I, I want to convince you that we lost so much in the fall. After Adam and Eve sinned, they began to die. You hearing me? And we're now 6,000 years from that creation. I can't imagine what Adam knew. He woke up and knew everything God knew. I don't know what to what level, but he had the, all the power that God had. And God commanded him to br- basically bring the garden under submission and tend it. How do you think he did that? I'll tell you this. He had such creative power because he was made in the image of God and after the likeness of God that when he saw a lion walk by, he said, Lion! And it was so. Well, that's what your Bible says. A bird flew flew by and he said, Pigeon! And it was so. Because he had creative power in his words because he was made in the image of God and after the likeness of God. And that has not changed today. You have creative power. I'm telling you, you are creating your tomorrow by what you're speaking today. You are the creator of your own culture. Whatever you're living with today, you created it by how you talked yesterday. Be seated. I got to move on. You, you, the most, I, I want to I submit to you that the most powerful force in this universe other than God is your spoken word. You say, I don't believe that. Well, what did Proverbs say? Proverbs said death and life, that you're either creating death or life by the way you're talking. Let's look at Matthew 12 and 36. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36 right quick. You have the power to create. Your words are so powerful that God warns you about it. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, or 36. I'm sorry, Matthew 12 and 36. Let's look at this. What does he say? He basically says, and they'll get it up here just momentarily, hey, give these girls running this screen a good hand. That's a hard job. (laughs) Or girl. I thought there was two of them in there. But I say unto you, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account, therefore, in the day of judgment. Why would God waste judgment on idle words? He 
He's got to judge six million people that are alive right now, not even talking about all the ones that's already been to the grave. Why would he take a section out of judgment with all the murders and rapes and incest and injustices and government takeover and genocide? Why would he call you up there and say, you said something under your breath when nobody knew you was talking? Why would he waste judgment on that? I'm going to tell you why. Because for your world and your family and your situation and your circle of influence, the most powerful, more powerful than an atomic bomb is what comes out of your mouth. You are a creator. Be seated. You think you can say just whatever you want to say. You think you can just let anything you want to spill out of your mouth and it's of no effect. I'm going to tell you, every word that comes out of you, like God spoke light and spoke things into existence, you're speaking things into existence in your world. That's why you can be sitting in your house at 2 o'clock in the morning and not have one problem, not have one fear, not have one situation, and you start talking talking about being fearful and you talk, start talking about being scared and you can scare yourself to death by what's coming out of your mouth. You literally change the atmosphere because your words are so powerful that God said, you better be careful what you say. You better be careful what spills off your lips. You better, you are a creator. You, he said, in fact, it's so serious. He said, you better let your yay be nay and your nay be nay. You be careful about what you say. Every, he said, every idle word, I'm going to bring it into judgment. Why? Because your mouth is more powerful than a bomb. It's more, it's more deadly than a gun. And it's more life-giving than any power on the face of this planet. You better hear what I'm saying today. I'm telling you that you can literally change the nature of a church, a group, a family, or anything by just changing their language. Man, I need to go on before I run out of time. I feel, I feel so much anointing right now. Mm. Hallelujah. And so, uh, uh, so uh, the reason that when they sinned, God got them out of the garden is because the tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up until they ate of that tree and brought rebellion, everything that came out of their mouth created good. The reason he didn't want them to eat of that tree is the moment they ate of the tree of evil, they would start creating evil. And now we are 6,000 years later living with the creation of people with loose lips and loose tongues. It is now proven that everything that God created, all matter, has frequency. They thought for a while that you had to be a, a, a living organism to have frequency, but they've now found that even stones, rocks, have frequency. That means they're alive. That means they're living. And they're able to actually find the frequency of all things. Frequency is basically sound. It's a sound that is admitted, but very little of our environment is a frequency that our ears can hear. They found the frequency of the planets. And they now can record the song coming from each planet in our universe. And you can now go to a symphony hall and pay a ticket to listen to the planets sing. They harmonize with each other. The one, one sounds like a drum, and one sounds like a cymbal, and one sounds like a violin, and one another sounds like a stringed instrument. And they found the, the frequency 
of everything all the way down to stones. And so they now believe because they can now use frequency or sound to pick ping pong balls up and tennis balls and move them around the room and set them on a shelf and move them. When they find the frequency of it, they can increase that frequency and move that tennis ball. And so they now believe, because they found the frequency of stones, they now believe that our ancestors were so much smarter than we were that that's how the pyramids were built. They've wondered because we don't have the power right now to take stones as big as this building and put them 150 feet in the air on the side of a pyramid. So they now believe that they did it with sound. They found the frequency of that stone and moved it with sound. They're proving that our DNA is connected to every living thing in this creation. That our DNA literally has a language and can speak. That's why two people that love each other can sit in a room side by side and for hours never open their mouth but feel so close to that other person because it's not coming from their mouth. Their DNA is communicating. You've you got to hear what I'm saying. We're connected to everything. We have influence. There is a circle of influence that we have. That's why you can't sneak into a room and, and sneak up on somebody because your DNA speaks to their DNA. You ever been in a room and just knew someone was behind you and you wheeled around and there they were and you said, don't do that. Don't walk up on me like that. You know why? You know why you knew they was there? You felt it. You felt there, there, there is a DNA in you that has a circle of influence. It in, Oh, you've you, you got to hear what I'm telling you. And when you start understanding this, you understand that how I feel about things and how I feel think about things and certainly how I speak about things has a circle of influence. It changes the way the universe responds to me. Oh. And that's what the Bible's talking about when it says death and life is in the power of your tongue. The way you speak is either going to make the universe around you work with you or work against you. It's going to make it your slave and it's going to work for you to bring good in your life or it's going to turn it against you to bring nothing but negative. Somebody said, that sounds like pop psychology. Well, they got it out of the Bible. It is the Word of God. And when you start understanding these concepts, all of a sudden you start understanding what Jesus was saying when he said, you don't have to praise me. You don't have to worship me. The stones already are. If you could hear them, the stones have a song. If you don't praise me, they will. When you understand this and you understand the power and the authority of it, be seated. You can also understand what Jesus was saying when he said, speak to the mountain. You have the creative power. Tell the mountain to be removed and cast into the sea and it will be done. Of course, Jesus wasn't you, wanting you to run around throwing mountains into oceans because then we'd have tsunamis. It was hyperbole. What he was saying is if you have a mountain in your way, you can speak. Oh, my God, have mercy. If you have something blocking your path, what Jesus was saying, listen, everybody here, Jesus was saying, you are not a victim to what I've made you the tender of. You're not a victim to what I gave you dominion over. Life does not have the authority to victimize you. If life and conditions and situations are victimizing you, it's only because you're not activating your faith. It, it's only because you're talking wrong. You're saying things, well, well, that's the way it goes with me. Well, I guess that's my luck. I, I guess if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Well, I guess that's just the way things go. You're speaking the universe to work against you. It's time for you to realize I am not a victim to life. I'm not a victim to circumstances. And I have been because I have not been talking right.
I'm not here for life to happen to me. I show up and happen to life. Be seated just a little longer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to move. My God, have mercy. James 3 and 6. James 3 and 6. James the third chapter and the sixth verse. I'm telling you right now already, already in this house, there's about five or six people that there ought to be something just vibrating in you. You ought to be like a pressure cooker already. There ought to be something in you saying, I can't wait for this man to give his altar call. I can't wait. I, I, I can't wait for him to get done. I, I'm enjoying what he's preaching, but man, I'm ready to turn this thing loose and let God work this in me. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the, the what? What is he talking about? He's talking about that God gave Adam and Eve dominion and creative power over this earth and it all comes in how you speak. What is nature doing to you? Is it destroying you or is it blessing you? Is it bringing favor or is it bringing death? Well, it may be. You ought to just record how you've been talking the last month and just ask, are you a victim of your circumstances or are you a victim of your own tongue? Nature changes depending on how you talk. And you can literally set fire in your house. You can bring hell to your home. And it all goes back to that tongue. You got hell in your home? It's because you're speaking it. You got hell in your marriage? It's because what you're saying. You got hell between you and your children? Well, how are you talking to them? What kind of tone have you set in your house? My kids are rebellious. Well, you probably created it. They probably learned all their talk and their smart mouth and everything else from you. You can't expect them to be different. Why would you expect them to be different than you are? Hmm. Man, I, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is on me today. That, that Somebody in this house ought to be making up in your mind right now. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. I'm telling you, after this message, I'll never, if God will help me, I'll never be the same. James literally says you have the power over the course of nature. Please be seated, I, I, and thank you for helping me. I'm not telling you be seated because I don't want you to help me. I, I, I just want to hurry and move on. I, I don't want to take advantage of your time. Proverbs 23 and 7. I, Proverbs 23 and 7. This might be the most important. This is the hinge, the, the linchpin, or the hinge in which all the rest of this is going to turn. For as a man thinketh in his heart... So is he. Now let me give you some help here. As he thinketh in his heart, not in his mind. The heart and the mind is two different compartments. The mind's just a clearing house where anything in the atmosphere or the devil or enemies or imps or whatever can dump into it. The heart is your soul. It's what you are. It's your true self. And so the only way I know how to describe this is I grew up on the coast. I grew up in, shrimp, in shrimping country. And they'd throw those nets out there. And those nets would catch all kind of stuff and drag it in, and that net is like your mind. It catches everything. You see stuff you wish you wouldn't have seen. You hear stuff you wish you wouldn't have heard. 
you come across things you wish. You're not judged by your mind. It's up to you what you take out of that mind, what you call and cast down vain imaginations and what you allow to transfer into your heart. Oh, I thank God that the Bible says as a man thinketh in his, I'm glad it don't say as a man thinketh in his mind because I've been riding down the road and said, where did that thought come from? That kind of thinking's not welcome in my mind. I'm culling that. I'm casting down that vain imagination. What gets in your heart is what you dwell on. What gets in your heart is what you ruminate over and what you handle and what... That's what the Bible's talking about when it says a man that that looketh upon a woman. It don't just say he looked at her. Keep quit knocking your husband's head off because somebody caught his eye. You, he can't help that. That's, that's the same thing happens to you when you see bluebell ice cream. The problem ain't when it comes in his mind. The problem's when he takes it to his heart. It didn't say he looked at her. He said he looked at her to lust. It means he grabbed a hold of that and ruminated about that and wondered how he could meet her again. Oh, come on, somebody. He took that into his heart and it began a... You, you know, the problem is not when you're riding down the road and Fox News says things are bad. The problem is when you let Fox News change your heart. All kind of things. I'm glad I'm not judged by what comes through my mind. God knows I'm not in control of what goes in my mind, but God knows I am in control of what I let make the transfer from my mind to my heart. My heart is what I'll become. My... You know what I am today? I'm either I'm either faithful or I'm unfaithful. And we misunderstand faithful. We think faithful just means we're where we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be there. No, it means full of faith. The reason I'm faithful to church is I'm full of faith that church helps me. Faithful means full of faith. I'm either faithful or I'm doubtful. I'm either positive or I'm negative. Come on. I'm either a believer or I'm a non-believer. I'm either a thrill to be around or I'm a dud. And it all comes down to what's in my heart because out of the heart the mouth speaketh. Let me tell you something. A man that's full of the Holy Ghost has the same initial thoughts when he hits his thumb with a hammer (laughs) as the rank center. All the same words fill his mind, but we don't speak out of our mind. At that moment, what really is in our heart comes out. And that's why the Holy Ghost man says, Oh, praise God, that hurt. And I can't tell you what the sinner says. But all the same words was in the mind. We don't speak out of our mind. And if, if you do, that's where your problems are. If you... Oh my God, if you speak directly out of that mind where all kind of junk shows up. Mm -hmm. You can be seated. My God, have mercy the Holy Ghost is in this place. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Boy, I'm telling you, God is about to work some miracles for some people in this house. Mm, 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 mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 
and verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is this saying? This is saying that everything around you is exalting itself against the knowledge of God. God says you're blessed. Fox Dew says the economy's bad. God says you're blessed when you give. The news around you says you better hang on. You better pinch your wallet. Things are getting tough. You see, somebody said, well, I'm a child of God. That means things are different. Actually, it doesn't. If you're a child of God that don't believe, then you have no more power than the sinner. If you're a child of God that believes you're a victim of this economy, then you're going to be a victim of this economy because all of this is activated by faith. Let me ask you this question. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I feel to ask it right now while I've really got your attention. Is it doubt when you think it? Or is it doubt when you speak it? Death is not life is not in the power of the thought. You got to get a hold of what I just said to you. Is it doubt because it enters your mind? Your mind can be a victim to all kind of stuff, but your heart's not. When that doubt comes in your mind, the Bible says you've got to cast it down. That's vain imagination. And you've got to speak faith because the power of your tomorrow is not in your thought processes. It's in what comes out of your heart. And if your heart believes, no matter what your mind is hearing, because you've got, oh my God, because you've been culling between your mind and your heart, and you've been saying, I'm going to let some things in my heart, but not other things. The only thing getting in my heart is faith. The only thing getting in my heart is the Word of God. The only thing that's getting in my heart is positive. Somewhere you got to say, doubt. I can't keep you from walking up my yard, but I can keep you from coming in my house. Fear, fear, I can't keep you from walking down the street, but you can't get past my gate. My God, have mercy. My God, have mercy. Be, 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 be seated. All of the forces... You say, well, I, don't, I, I just don't know that I believe about the, all this that you're praying. I just hadn't bought into all this culture stuff yet. Well, let me ask you, why is it that some people, everything they touch goes bad? Anybody ever known anybody like that? I mean, if you gave them a brass monkey, they'd break his ears off. You could give them a 5,000-year-old brass monkey from Egypt that's been through 10,000 10, people's hands, and the first thing that will happen when they get it is a break in half. You're like, how did you do that? That thing's 5,000 years old. Nobody's ever broke it. You know why? Because the, they've turned the powers of the universe against them. And there's other people, no matter what they touch, it goes good. I mean, you look at them and like, dude, you could walk across a cow pasture, stamp, step in a cow patty. All the rest of us would just get cow manure in our shoes. But you find a piece of gold in that cow patty. Next news, we know you're a millionaire because you stepped in a cow patty. How many of you know Somebody like each person I described. Raise your hand. Think about how each one of those people talk. 
the person that the good happens to, they're the jovial, most happy, most positive talking person you know. And the person that everything goes bad, they're the most negative. And you say, well, it's because good stuff happens to the, that person and bad stuff, and so they're speaking. No, that's not true. Let me present something to you. You don't, you don't speak what you think. You think what you speak. You struggle with that? Let's look at verse Samuel 30 and 6. I'm going to give you a little simple illustration of exactly what I'm talking about. And every one of you has either done it or you heard your mother do it. Let's use moms that won't be too inflicting on you, okay? Moms going, this place is a mess. This place is turned upside down. Somebody, my, my Lord, it looks like a tornado came through this. What's going on? You kids, you, you, you. And the phone rings. Hello? <laughs> Wonderful. How are you today? Oh, yes, the Lord's been good to me, too. <laughs> Isn't God good? Aren't we having such great revival? Oh, yes. And in a few minutes, you're looking at your mom and like, because now she's dancing around the house and singing and everything's good. You know why? Because her thoughts totally changed. And David was greatly distressed, distressed, for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man his sons and daughters. But David encouraged himself in the you know what he started saying? The Lord is good. He started singing those old songs that he wrote on the hillside. Great is the Lord, and he's greatly to be praised. I'm gonna tell you, you don't think you don't talk positive because you think positive. You think positive because you started talking positive. Open your mouth and say it. Open your mouth and talk it. Be seated. I'm almost done. I'm really, really almost done. I want to convince you, you are not a victim to your circumstances. You're not a victim to your situation. I don't care what happened to you. I don't care who did what, who treated you which way. I don't care who molested you. I don't care who betrayed you. I don't care who took from you or stole from you. How many more days are you going to let that bother you? When are you going to finally put that in a compartment somewhere, shut the door, and move on? Somebody said, well, you just, you just don't understand, Brother Copeland. Well, maybe I don't, but maybe Nick, maybe Nick Vujicic could, could explain it to you. Anybody recognize that name? Nick Vujicic was born with no arms and no legs. All he is is a body with a head. When he was born, his family, saw, his mom and dad saw him in the hospital and turned around and walked out and left him. They said, we're not bringing that home. I think my mic quit working. But at 17 years old, Nick said at Sunday school, could I testify? And he started talking about how good God had been to him. And his pastor said, man, there, there's something special about that boy. Now, Nick makes over a million a year. In the millions of years, a public speaker and has written his first book, working on his second book. But you, poor little you, you've been victimized. 
You're a victim of your situation. I feel so sorry for you. Nick probably don't. Nick would probably ask you, when are you going to change the way you talk? When are you going to decide the only thing you can be a victim to is your own processes? My God, my my Lord. Maybe we can explain it to to Oscar uh, Pistorius. Oscar Pistorius was born with no legs from the knee down. What was there was mangled. fitted him with artificial limbs and in 2012 he won the Olympic gold running my God have mercy and you say oh I'm a victim you just don't know what I've been through you just don't know what I face no your problem is what you're saying Change your talk and change your life. Change the way you... Oh, my God. I'm so close to done, you can't believe it. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. Exodus, the first chapter and the seventh uh, verse. Your words are either bringing you success or destroying your life, but they're not doing both. Did you get that? Your words are either bringing you success and bringing you life or they're destroying you and bringing you death. But they're not doing both. It's one or the other. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. You know what? I I, I think I said that backwards. I, I said that backwards. That was my fault. Exodus 7 and 11. No, Exodus 11 and 7. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm a little dyslexic at times, but I tell you what, I'm not victimized by it. I'll tell you that right now. Woo! But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that you may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. When you are a child of God and you're full of faith, God said, when it's dark in Egypt, it's going to be light in Goshen. When there's flies in Egypt, there's not going to be any flies in Goshen. When there's death in Egypt, there's not going to be any death in Goshen because those are my people. And if you can activate the faith in this house, you will not be victimized by this economy. When this economy is going down, your business will go up. When the economy is struggling, you won't be struggling. Everybody on your job will be looking at you, saying what's different about you. And that is your testimony. Stand together and lift your hands. Come on, stand together, everybody, everybody, everybody. Everybody, musicians, come, please. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here. Uh, uh, Church family, I need you to carry this deal right now because God's about to work a miracle for five people in this house. uh, God wants to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost, and he wants to work a miracle for five people in this house. Everything in your home, he wants to change. Everything in your mind, he wants to change. He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and change your world. Some of you that have the Holy Ghost, he wants to change the way you talk. He he wants to change your heart. I want you to listen to me just a minute. Nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want y'all to listen to this. Charity giveth itself rich, and covetousness hoards itself poor. A stream of plenty will not flow toward a stingy, hoarding, doubting thought. Because stinginess so shrinks your heart that it has no room for the blessing of God to fit in. There must be a corresponding current of generosity and open-mindedness going out from you. One current gives birth and creates the other because you're a creator. 
A little rivulet of stingy mindedness, a thought of weak poverty current going out can never have a counter current coming toward you of generosity and plenty. Our mental attitude determines the current that's coming toward us. The economy of this world does not have the authority to happen to you or to victimize you. It is time right now. It's time right now for you to decide. Right now in this service, it's time for you to decide. Poverty, you can walk up on my porch, but you can't get in my house. Mm. Fear, you can come in my yard, but you're not getting near my children. Anxiety, you can attack my mind, but you're not getting in my heart. God is calling for somebody in this place right now. And what he's saying to you is, I want to change everything. I want to change your marriage. I want to change your home. I want to change your children. I want to change your outlook. I'm, I'm ready to change everything in your world today. Right now, today. And somebody in this house needs to make up in your mind I'm leaving this miraculous service and I'm going home a different person I want you to hear this before I quit I'm, I'm, I'm moments from walking out of this pulpit but listen I went to a town of 240 people several years ago 26 years ago that's where I pastor a town of 240 people there's nothing around my church but cow pastures that's it. Cow pastures and farms and my church. There was under, under 30 people there when I got there and voted me in as pastor. And all my friends, because I was a national evangelist traveling across the country preaching to some of the biggest churches in Pentecost, said, what on earth are you doing there? That place is a preacher-killing church. You can't have revival in a town of 240 people. What are you doing going there? Man, you won't last there 18 months. You're wasting your time. Nobody wants to live in Sebastopol, Mississippi. And every time they'd say it, the hackles would stand up on the back of my neck. And I'd say, you're not in control of my world. I, 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 I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm not here for any other reason to help you pardon the personal reference. But 26 years later, there's over 100,000 square feet of church plant there. Estimated in the worth of somewhere between 16 and 20 million dollars. Today, there was probably 800 people in church. Yeah. There's about 30 preachers out of that church that call me pastor. We've started six other daughter works out of that church. There's an architect right now drawing and working on plans for a 2,500-seat auditorium. The one we're in seats 1,300 with a balcony. Oh, You're not hearing what I'm saying. I didn't go there to be victimized by a small town. I went there. The small town didn't happen to me. I went there and happened to the small town. Over 200 families have moved from other states to be a part of that church. They come there and get the Holy Ghost and they move to that town. I got people in our church doing subdivision developments right now. My God, have mercy. 20 of the businesses in town are owned by people in our church. Some of them just 18, 19, 20 years old that own clothing stores and they're opening ice cream shops and restaurants and the whole nature of that little town is changing because somebody made up their mind. God gave me dominion 
And I'm not a victim to my circumstances. I'm not a victim to my location. And somebody needs to make up in your mind about Red, Red Bluff and say, somebody somewhere had it wrong about Red Bluff. Let me tell you what Red Bluff is. Red Bluff's the center of revival. Red Bluff is the greatest town in the state of California. And I didn't come for Red Bluff to happen to me. I came to happen to Red Bluff. Everything's changing. Somebody lift your hands right now. The Holy Ghost wants to speak to you. Come on, lift your hands right now. The Holy Ghost wants to speak to you. Come on, lift your hands right now. The Holy Ghost wants to talk. Come on, the Holy Ghost is talking to people in this place right now, right now. 